Uh, and this is kind of the last last big topic. So we'll 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 go through this as as, as much as we can. So um, why create this culture of fear, right? Why does J. Edgar Hoover want to um, create a uh, a society that is paranoid of you know community gatherings of people coming together and taking care of each other? Why is he so scared of that? Well, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was looking for something called the Black Messiah. That's what he called it, uh, which was somebody that is. Uh, obviously a person of color that is going to bridge uh, the gaps between the races and uh, create uh, what he was afraid of, which was a race war, right? Uh, where where this black messiah will lead these people of color and, and they will take over the country and, oh my goodness, uh, America is no longer the land of the free and the home of the brave, uh, but a country of black and brown people coexisting with uh, white people and boy howdy to a racist white supremacist like fucking J. Edgar Hoover. That's a that's a goddamn nightmare. That is that is something that uh, we don't want to see ever in our in our lifetime, according to J. Edgar Hoover. And so whenever he would see prominent p uh, figures in the civil rights movement, he automatically assumed um, that they were uh, they that they might be the black messiah, that they might lead people into liberation. They might lead people into freedom. They might lead people to equality, uh, and you know, to, uh, to 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 someone in a position of power that that thrives on divide, that thrives on uh, the the disunification of the country, where people are paranoid about their neighbors. They're paranoid about people gathering at, at churches. They're people g gathering in uh, community centers. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this motherfucker was probably anti book club because holy shit, why are so many people gathering around talking about books when the FBI can just tell you which books are good and which books are bad. And that's all you need to know. Right. Uh, this guy, this guy is basically, um, uh, he, he, <laughs> he is one of the people that uses 1984 as an instruction manual. Uh, which is not what 1984 is meant for. Uh, so he's he he got a different fucking uh, lesson from 1984, where he was like, "Boy, I don't understand why this narrator just won't listen to this point of authority." <laughs> so at first he thought Malcolm, uh, sorry, not Malcolm X, MLK. <laughs> we were just talking about Malcolm X. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. might be the Black Messiah, right? Uh, then later he thought maybe it was Bobby Seale, and then later he thought maybe it was Fred Hampton. He goes down the list. To, to me, this kind of sounds like, you know the people that call for apocalypse? Like, there, there's always a date that the apocalypse is going to come. Uh, I remember, like, when I, was in, uh, when I was in college and when I got out of college, it was just like every every year we would hear these people be like, this is it. This is the day. This is the day that it's going to happen. And then the day comes and nothing fucking happens. And they're like, we miscalculated. It's this other day that that that's what it, we were. Somebody forgot to carry the one. Frank, did you forget to carry the one? You fucking idiot. You, that's it's Frank's fault. So this is the day. And then that day comes and they fucking and nothing happens. Uh, and then they're like, but we what we really meant, though, was it's this other, it's the third, the third day is the day because it's, you know, uh, and they just keep going down the, like, that's what I feel like J. Edgar Hoover is doing. Like, he's like, it's this fucking guy. He's the black Messiah and he's going to fucking destroy freedom. He's doing, okay. All right. We killed that guy and it's still happening. Okay. No, we're kidding. It's this other guy that's like feeding people and stuff and that's the black messiah okay we put him in prison and it's still happening what if it's this other person that we can like frame and assassinate using the police and like just claim that they're running guns it's not okay well do you think it's somebody else do you think you're wrong J. Edgar Hoover do you think you're just a racist wrong asshole and you should just shut the fuck up and not talk <laughs> That's what I feel like J. Edgar Hoover is. So he basically, anybody that he distrusted and he didn't like, 
Hoover would just name a as as a communist. He would just label them as a communist, right? Um, and this included someone named Stanley Levinson. Now, Stanley Levinson was a lawyer, and he helped uh, MLK with the um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, and to to J. Edgar Hoover, in his mind, it was like, holy shit, they're crowning the Black Messiah. So he labeled Levinson a communist. Again, a lot of this stuff. Um, doesn't really doesn't really work like n none of the stuff really ended up working uh now hoover also tried to get kennedy to disavow martin luther king jr and he just like he kept pushing the communist angle and jfk invited king after i think the march on washington and he let martin luther king know that uh that J. Edgar Hoover was spying on him. That's how MLK found out that he was being watched by uh, the FBI, right? And around this time is when they were they figured out that he was cheating on his wife, and they used that information to be like, "Oh, you're cheating on your wife? Then you should probably fucking kill yourself." Um, and they and they you know kept fucking pushing that sort of stuff. Now, Robert. Robert F. Kennedy, RFK, did approve a 30-day tap. And, and part of this seems like, to me, what it seemed like when I was reading this was like, RFK approved this 30-day tap just to get J. Edgar Hoover to shut the fuck up. Right? And he was like, fine, you got a month. If you can fucking find um, any sort of information that this guy is a communist that is sowing divide in this country... Uh, for the sake of communism, then fine. I will. I will order something, and we'll figure. We'll go from there. But after the thirty days, the the uh, he he was like, "We're done. We're not wiretapping these people anymore. We're not infiltrating, uh, you know, uh, MLK's people. This this isn't right. You didn't find anything, uh, and you're and all of that shit is bullshit." And, and then he discontinued it. He was like, if you if you tap if you look into these movement again, basically you're doing it without the authorization of the president, uh, uh, you know, without the authorization of this administration, uh, which would mean that he would be operating uh, as a as a rogue agent, right? <laughs> uh, they also claimed that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. This was this was a little shocking to me. Is they claimed that they the King was present when there was a parishioner getting raped. Uh, and they had no evidence except this recording. And they said, look, King was overlooking all of this. And people that he was trying to convince with this were like, wait a minute, how do you know it's King? It's just, this is just a recording. You have no photographic evidence. You have nothing. Um, so they tried to like pin this weird rape thing on, on Martin Luther King Jr. when you know his uh, infidelity wasn't uh, getting people to jump off the uh, jump off the king train, right? Uh, so again, later Martin Luther King Jr. gets assassinated. So they moved to the Black Panthers. The Panthers already had a very difficult relationship with law enforcement at this point. And, uh, you know, their cop watch program led to Republicans uh, taking a strong anti-gun stance because, oh boy, black people can own guns too. And that's, oh, it's, that's a threat. They're so scary, the black people. Oh my God. That's what California Republicans said. And they pushed for, you know, uh, gun restrictions. It's the only time in human history uh, that uh, Republicans have been anti-gun is when they found out that, oh, black people can own guns and use the law to their advantage to make sure that cops don't brutalize people uh, that look like them. Uh, and instead of going like, maybe cops should stop brutalizing people, fucking period. Uh, they were like, nope, nope, we're going to do this different thing. We're going to do this much more racist thing. So... Uh, Bobby Seale was next on the list, right? Bobby Seale was his big organizer. He was a, uh, he was he was actually a, a very gifted organizer, and he created the survival program. That was one of the things that he, he that he created, and one of the major things that came out of that was the Breakfast for Kids program. But they also essentially um, proved that socialized medicine can work. 
Uh, they were providing free ambulance, excuse me, free ambulance rides to elderly people. Um, they actually um, were on the forefront of sickle cell anemia research. Uh, and they were doing all this stuff that the government can do, but chooses not to, right? They were basically proving that uh, the government has the, the resources to, to do it because this DIY on the ground, you know, low income grassroots movement uh, led by primarily black people, we're doing all the things the government can do with with you know a a fraction of their budget, and they prove that it can work. Uh, and the thing that really pissed off the Nixon administration, which pushed uh, J. Edgar Hoover to continue his old uh, his old racist fucking black messiah hunt, was uh, was the Breakfast for Kids program, which later, which later. Uh, I think maybe six or seven years later, was adopted by the government. And had it not been for the Black Panthers, wouldn't have been adopted by the government. They would have never even fucking thought about it. And the reason why J. Edgar Hoover goes after these survival programs is because they essentially create a template and they send it off to different communities. And those communities start succeeding and thriving. And J. Edgar Hoover calls them the greatest threat to international security. After the survival program starts succeeding, J. Edgar Hoover calls them the greatest threat to national security. Why? Because they're feeding people without the government's authorization, without getting permits. They're helping people get ambulance rides. They're helping people get checkups at clinics. And they're not doing this by holding the, the doctors hostage. They're not doing this by going in and shaking down, uh, you know, mom and pop stores or anything. They're just going in and saying, hey, look, your community's in trouble. Uh, and we're trying to help out. We're trying to feed these kids so that they can do better in school and, you know, help succeed and come back and help our communities. And people just willingly donated food. Uh, they would donate groceries. Uh, there were there were like ER doctors from hospitals that uh, would, you know, they would they would donate their time to the clinic. And they would do free checkups to people. And if they needed uh, uh, more medical attention, they would let them know. Uh, and basically, like, it it was low-income communities helping low-income communities get out of being low-income communities, right? Um, if you remember the live stream from from last night where, where you had, uh, and, you know, one of fucking Warren Buffett's buddies saying we need more poverty in order to elevate uh, people out of poverty, which makes no fucking sense. Uh, this is basically the opposite of that, and it's and it's actually proven to work. Uh, there's actually proof that what um, the Panthers were doing is the way that you uplift people from poverty by getting rid of the things that cause poverty. Not let's keep doing the thing that causes poverty, and by creating more poverty, we'll get more people out of poverty. That doesn't make any fucking sense. The major thing inside COINTELPRO was that they had to, quote, neutralize the Black Panthers. They had to neutralize the Black Panthers. That's what COINTELPRO said. So finally, we get to, Black, uh, we get to Fred Hampton, who, who, did, who, who did get a lot of attention because of the trial, uh, because of um, how, well, how good of a speaker he was. Uh, and he would do these speeches outside the trial of Bobby Seale where, you know, they were pretty much like chaining him and they were gagging his mouth and, and like, you know, reporters were basically like, this kind of looks like the slave trade. And maybe you guys should stop doing that, uh, because you're not helping. Right. Uh, so Bobby Seale's arrested. He's, he's trying to defend himself. Uh, Fred Hampton is outside the court, uh, courthouse giving these speeches, he rises to the ranks and becomes the um, the chairman of the Chicago chapter uh, of the Black Panther Party. And uh, this is also around the time where there's there's quite a bit of informants within, within the party, uh, within the Black Panther Party, right? There's quite a bit of FBI informants. And the way that they get these FBI informants is, you know, they'll get them on a misdemeanor. Right. The, it's like, oh, man, you you cross you accidentally cross state lines from Chicago into Indiana. 
while you're on parole. You're not supposed to do that. Well, we got the FBI involved because you crossed state lines. Whether it was an accident, whatever, still, you probably don't need to go back to prison. Uh, you know, so that's a warning at best. You cross state lines to go, like you went over to, I don't know, get some alcohol that might be cheaper in Indiana than Chicago, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and so they get caught, they get this thing, and then they go, well, we won't put you in prison if you work for us. If you become our informant, we'll place you with uh, Fred Hampton, we'll place you with this prominent uh, Black Panther, and uh, all you have to do is feed us information, uh, and we'll take it from there. So a gentleman by the name of William O'Neill was the informant, uh, and he worked closely with Fred Hampton. And uh, he's the one that helped the Chicago Police Department raid Hampton's apartment, Ham Hampton's Panther pad, as they called it, because uh, it would be multiple Panthers that would sleep under one roof. Um, and he's the one that left the door open so that the cops can come in uh, and essentially uh, murder everybody in there. Uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a few Panthers got killed, including Fred Hampton. The first person that was killed... Uh, was by a guy by the name of Mark Clark. He was he was uh, he was standing by the door, and they shot him through the door, and they shot him in the heart, and he died instantly. And when he died, he he fired a round because his body seized, and he fired a round directly into the floor. Um, and that was the only shot that was fired by a Black Panther. The cops fired ninety rounds into this apartment uh and the other thing o'neill did was he drugged fred hampton and then the cops after they had you know riddled this apartment full of bullets uh they shot fred hampton in the head and uh and they assassinated him this kid was 21. He was talking to uh, Appalachian white boys, as they call it. He was talking to um, the Latin community, the Asian community, and, and building a coalition. He was he was uniting um, all of these different groups and kind of pointing out that hey, it's not skin color that is the problem; it's economics. Uh, it's capitalism. Capitalism is the issue here. And we got to push back against the system uh, and create a self-sustaining system for ourselves. You know, we have to create a system that uh, is, is going to make lives not just better for ourselves, but also for our kids and future generations so that they don't have to suffer. Uh, and they killed him, right? This, this kid, th this inspirational kid that was bridging gaps uh, at age 21 in front of his pregnant wife. Um, and you know, they, they left the doors open, a bunch of cops quit after that. And, uh, you know, the ending of the black Panther, the, the, the chapter of the black Panthers is, is really, really tragic. It's a very tragic story. So I want to, I want to quote Fred Hampton because this is one of the best quotes from Fred Hampton which is, uh, you can kill the revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. And in reality, uh, they haven't, right? Uh, uh, without the Black Panther Party, I don't think there would have been a Black Lives Matter movement or, or that powerful of a Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I think what, what needs to happen is we need to learn the history of the Black Panthers. We need to learn the history of Martin Luther King and MLK or, uh, or Malcolm X um, and and pretty much anybody else that has uh, been on the forefront of any sort of civil rights movement and learn from them. Because what we learn is the idea works. It's just we got to keep an eye out for infiltrators, surveillance, spying, that sort of stuff, uh, and come up with countermeasures for it so that these ideas can thrive and they can do what they were meant to do, um, which is to help improve the lives of other people. 
And you still see their legacy today, right? MLK, uh, Malcolm X, the, the Panthers. Um, civil disobedience is huge. And we talk about civil disobedience often. And what protesters are being cited for, you know, things like, oh, well, you don't have a permit to protest. And it's like, that's not how fucking civil disobedience works. So then you have school lunches. That wouldn't have happened without the Panthers. You have the proof that Medicare for All actually works. They, 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 they proved it. They proved that it works. Socialized medicine works. Uh, the anti-war movement wouldn't be as strong if it wasn't for Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who very vocally spoke out against the military-industrial complex and said that, hey, look, capitalism, the military, and racism are all intertwined with each other. That was one of the speeches that he gave before he was assassinated was a very anti-war speech, was a very anti-capitalist speech. Again, stuff that's not taught in schools, folks. This stuff is not taught in schools. I didn't learn that I didn't learn about Martin Luther King Jr. being fucking anti-war and, and a socialist and an anti-capitalist. You know, it's just this is not stuff that they teach you in schools. The fight for in income inequality. I mean, one of the major things that uh, MLK was working on the time was the Poor People's March. I do believe we saw a version of the Poor People's March a couple years ago in various different cities. But that sort of stuff needs to happen more. You know, I think the push for a general strike would be a lot more difficult without the civil rights movement. And again, and this is this is something that is uh, not a lot. Some, some people have issues with it. A very close friends of mine have issues with this. We have to bridge those divides. We have to do what Fred Hampton did. Uh, and what Fred Hampton did, again, was, was break racial barriers and show that the real culprit of people suffering, the real culprit of people being kept down, is not race, is not the color of your skin, is not the, the invisible lines that you cross, but the economic system that has been put into place. There are economic forces that are that are... Prevent you, preventing you from succeeding and, and achieving the American dream. And because he was doing that, he was assassinated. But that's what we need to do, right? We have to look at people that have... Um, that, that have, you know, gotten roped up into these conservative ideologies that don't serve them any good. And you got to look at them and be like, well, look, what you're talking about is the same thing that a black person talks about. It's the same thing that the working class Asian person talks about. It's the same thing the Latin community talks about. And the answer is not in capitalism. The answer is not in this government structure that is run on capitalism. And you pull them into the fold I mentioned this in my stand-up thing. Look, you, you can't move forward and leave a bunch of people behind because you're creating the same problems, right? You're creating a culture where it's haves and the have-nots, right? You can't move forward without taking these people along with us. If we're going to make people's lives better, then we have to make everybody's lives better, including the conservative white people, including conservative black people. What has to be part of the responsibility of the people trying to create a better future is to educate those people that we are on our side because they have been convinced by massive amounts of propaganda that we are against them and that the notion of socialism, the notion of community, the notion of being there for each other is actually bad because America is riddled and rooted in not just racism, but a culture of paranoia. And whether they knew that they were doing that or not, but the folks in the civil rights movement, MLK, Silkley Mark Carmichael, Bobby Seale, Fred Hampton, Malcolm X, they were going against the idea of paranoia. And they were unfortunately killed for it. The last thing I will say is I, I really do think that J. Edgar Hoover and a lot of these people that are part of the uh, the intelligence communities. They're just, 
they're just serial killers with a badge. That's essentially what they are. They've assassinated people. They've run plots. I mean, they act very much like serial killers. They think that everybody's out to get them. The boogeyman of communism is out there, right? These are mental health issues. And these, these people that refuse to, to accept that they might have some mental health issues uh, are granted these positions of power to essentially assassinate and kill people that go against the ideology of paranoia. That's how I view J. Edgar Hoover. I, 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 I look at J. Edgar Hoover as, as a serial killer with a badge. That's what I see him as. Uh, you can you can disagree with me if you'd like to, but you know this guy has has orchestrated the assassination and has tormented people. Uh, I mean, this, the things that he would do are just awful, are just awful for a group of people that are trying to feed kids. You know, so I don't see this person being good. I don't see the FBI uh, being a good organization. Uh, I've talked about this show before, Criminal Minds. I I I like I I do enjoy that show, but I for part of me has to remove the fact that these are FBI agents going after serial killers. And and what I do like about that show is it's not just shoot him up, you know. Oh, he's a bad guy. Blam blam blam, kill him. Right? It's it's there's a psychological analysis, and and a lot of times they do address like, oh, this person is doing this because of this economic force or this uh this trauma that comes from economic force like there's a lot of that uh, what i dislike is there is uh the 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 primary focus of the show is championing the fbi uh to be this like really great organization that only goes after the bad guys uh while they ignore the fact that they have uh sur they're, they're surveilling protesters uh, and they think that if you're if somebody that fights for equality, then you might be a communist, that you might you might be anti-American and and all that kind of stuff. So I do I do dislike that about the show. Now, had it been a show where the behavioral analysis unit is sort of its own agency uh, outside the FBI, outside the intelligence community, um, then I think I would have almost no problem with that show at all. Uh, but because it does deal within the FBI, it, it, it creates a little bit of a problem for me. But the characters are really good. Uh, their analysis of mental health is really interesting. Um, they address certain mental health issues uh, in a really fascinating way. And really, that show should be like uh, an example of this is how you create the worst of the worst by putting them in, by putting people in the worst of the worst situations. That's how you create serial killers, right? And I don't know J. Edgar Hoover's past. You know, I don't know if he came from a violent family or so on and so forth. But what he did was effectively use the FBI to orchestrate assassinations uh, and effectively try to kill programs that would have uh, eradicated poverty uh, in a pretty in a pretty large way. So, uh, you know. Keep keep that in mind before people start championing the FBI. I do want to look at your comments because because uh, I see that there's a bunch of comments here. Uh, MLK, Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, the original Rainbow Coalition. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was called. I, I forgot that that's what they called it. Um, the FBI is anti book club, as Holly says. Uh, oh, is like March March fourth was to been the it, oh that's when they said the true inauguration was going to happen the QAnon people yeah you know that's th that was another bizarre thing and now it's moved to March twentieth which is like what I you know he I Trump lost he lost the election uh, and now we just have to kind of move the fuck on um, Aram. Uh, Oh, we're, we're uh, talking about the assassination here. Assassination is also denial of due process. It's appalling for many reasons and violates many constitutional and moral and ethical tenets. Trump or Obama lifted the ban on political assassination. You're saying probably Trump. Uh, and Holly is, is coming back because uh, Obama authorized drone strikes, which is assassinations. Um, yeah, I'm not sure who lifted the ban on political assassinations, but if you're if you're gonna uh, if you're still gonna approve drone strikes, then I'm pretty sure 
that's still a form of assassination. Uh, Shane, you are leaving some links in the comments there about Malcolm X, I'm assuming. Thank you for leaving those. Those are going to be very helpful. Um, Holly says you can't kill the idea. Exactly. And that was the point. You, you can kill the revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. As long as these ideas are out there, as long as people are there to listen to them, um, you know, uh, once they're in here, it'll spread. Kind of like what we're doing with these with these live streams, right? Let me hop over to Rockfin here. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Fred asks, so Hoover was actually looking for present-day Jesus. Oh, man. Uh, I think if he was looking for present-day Jesus, it would be a different... It, it, that would be a different story. I, I it, Because I'm pretty sure... J. Edgar Hoover was the type of person that was like, Jesus was white. He was a white man with chiseled abs and pectoral muscles. All right. He was not some brown feller. He definitely wasn't black either, but the black Messiah, like, I'm pretty sure he claimed the Antichrist, uh, or the black Messiah might be the Antichrist, which is why he was so concerned about it. Even though, um, even though what they were doing is probably what Jesus would have been would have would have advocated for, minus the holding guns and all that. And, uh, but again, Jesus did beat the shit out of bankers because they were uh, uh, frauding average people. Uh, Fred also says the 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 plague of mutual aid. Oh, the horror! <laughs> yeah, that's what they're afraid of, man. Uh, and I'm honestly, you know, I, I'm 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 glad that they haven't gone after mutual aids because again, it looks really bad. When a large government organization goes after small um, mutual aid uh, uh, organizations, you know, so uh, yeah, it, it, we need more. Uh, we need more mutual aids. Uh, Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of uh, of various shows that I uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows, the Forkful of Noodles live virtual comedy shows. Uh, the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website. But if you're also on financial stable ground, you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets and bonus content. And go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to, to make any kind of financial contributions. But if you can't, it's not a necessity. Most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -H -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.